you know, sometimes, I honestly, when choosing to do which videos to do, I probably pick the most random thing I can and just see what I can roll with it. And I decided to go with a short introduction to the Second Ottoman Venetian War, which I chose because it includes the first battle using cannon, and that seemed pretty cool to me. But it's not exactly a complicated war. It's not exactly a war which is, um, how do I put this politely, steeped in nuance. It's pretty much big rising power neighbor sees someone in way and smashes them, uh, tries to, and smashes them up. And the, uh, the other neighbor doesn't have anyone to call upon for aid. No one. Really. As such, it's a simple war. But it gets overlooked, and as said, it's got some interesting things in it. Some very interesting things in it. First of all, a little shameless plug. <coughs> yeah, shameless book plug. Next year, hopefully, I'll have some more books out that you can all you can all uh, that can also go through and you know provide funding for. This is when you realise you are such a historian. Basically, the money comes in and it goes out on more history. <laughs> right then, so. The Venetian Empire. Or rather, Republic slash Empire slash collection of interesting groups which basically work together for a trading monopoly to make themselves very, very rich. Now... The Venetian Empire was rich not because of its land acquisitions, although they were at key strategic points. No, it was rich because of that uh, Trato de Mer Domina dalle Flotte, Venetia and Idioso Senacolo 16. Now, this is part of the important Silk Road. This is this is the, the road from the east to the west, and the west to east. It's always travelled. And if you, the more of that road you control, the more money you can make. This is why people go voyaging around the world. Why the Portuguese go off around the coast of Africa to the uh, to the far east and go, woohoo, we made it! And the Spanish go to South America and go, it's because they think they'll get there, they're around that way and they'll get there quicker, and then go, well, we made it! Hang on, we made, went somewhere completely different. And, you know, that's why we have Native Americans are called Indians. Well, they knew of India in the east, so when they they, they they went there and they found them. They included, presumed they were Indians. <sighs> so basically, a lot of geography has been designed and has been named by people who were absolutely, completely, and utterly lost. We'll leave that to one side. That's a whole other branch of history. But basically, my experience, anyone who is a geographer. The reason they're so good at doing maps is because they permanently get lost. And therefore, my theory is that the mapping side of navigation, which took place in this sort of this sort of similar sort of period as the Venetian Republic and Ottoman Empire had their wars, was basically a result of a whole load of geographers actually getting on ships and getting lost. It happens. But, leaving that to one side... As you can see, there's a small issue here. If you're the Ottoman Empire, you want to be making the money off this. But you're not. Because if people take the stuff on ships, it goes round. Instead of it going through Constantinople and various other critical places, which used to be Byzantium, and was the Byzantine Empire, uh, it's going to Venice, and Venice are taking it further. 
And they're making a lot of money off this. And, okay, you can sit there and go, well, there are lots of reasons for this, that, and the other, but mostly those reasons are cover for greed. The Ottomans wanted the money. They wanted the power the money brought them, would bring them, and the capabilities it would bring them, which would enable them to go for things which are more money. Especially when you consider the amount of people they're trying to fight. Because they're always trying to expand. Why are they always trying to expand? Well, best form of defense is a good offense. And the Ottomans understood this from early on. The Ottomans had found themselves with neighbors who were big and powerful. And rather than waiting for those big, powerful people to get organized and start attacking them, they attacked them first. Now, longer term, this doesn't, doesn't exactly lead to a good scenario, because eventually you do run up against someone who's big and powerful as well, and is prepared to fight you. Eventually, it happens. But there is an advantage here. Something which the Ottomans work out very quickly. Venice is all about maneuver warfare. They're all about small forces being deployed like pinpricks in order to win battles. And it's allowed them to be very successful. It really does. In the first Venetian, Ottoman Venetian War, it allows them to be successful. In other wars, it gives them success. It's a, it's a great maneuver based strategy. However, it works too well because you start to think you don't need big forces. You start to think you're never going to need big forces. And in a war which ends up with Ottoman cavalry turning up at the gates of Venice, or rather very close to the gates of Venice, there's a debate as to how close they get. They certainly reach um, the Venetian territory in northern Italy. But some records would tell you they only got to uh, Frulli, Frulli. Some uh, Veneto. Others even suggest they might have got as far as Lombardia. But there is a debate as to whether or not they reached the gates to Venice. The point is, that pinpricking force, that force of manoeuvre, is great as long as you can do two things. One, manoeuvre, and two, choose where you fight. And the easy way to take away both of those things, your ability to manoeuvre and your ability to choose where you fight, is to attack with sufficient force somewhere you have to defend. Then you're fudged, for want of a better word. You are frigating fudged. Completely and utterly. Because you can no longer maneuver, and you suddenly need a large force, and you probably don't have one available. Because that would have been expensive. So, the war begins. And the Ottoman-Venetian War starts basically because the Turks, the Ottomans, under the command of Admiral Kemal Reis, are sent out to fight them. In January 1499, Kemal Reis set sail from Constantinople with force of ten galleys, four other types of ships, and in July 1499, met with the remainder of the Ottoman fleet, taking over its command with the, uh, with the charge to wage large-scale war of the Republican of, uh, against the Republic of Venice. This combined fleet consisted of 67 galleys, 20 galliots, and about 200 smaller vessels. In August of that year, 25th of August 1499, well, let's put it this way. Camoris bumps into the Venetian fleet of 47 galleys, 17 galleots, and about 100 smaller vessels under the command of Antonio Grimani. 
Grimani would end up eventually becoming the Doge of Venice. Uh, but at this time he was 65, a proven captain in battle, and... He had never been an admiral before, though. He'd been given command because he generously donated 16,000 ducats to the state and personally funded the arming of 10 galleys. Let's be honest, considering the Venetian fleet consisted of 47 galleys, the fact he provided 10 of them is kind of generous. However, still, he was not told whether to fight a defensive or offensive campaign by the council. Now, this is where we get into an interesting discussion, because there is a debate as to who was the fault for the Venetian loss. They arrived in Cape Zotrino, in the Ionian Sea, and spotted Camoris. Many of the Venetian captains ignored Gramani's orders to attack the Ottomans, and he himself did not take part in the battle. He's accused, therefore, of being indecisive and reluctant to attack, which led to failure during the battle. But honestly, if you give an order to attack, most of your ships don't go, then you're supposed to go and get yourself killed? On the second day, Grimani ordered the crews to kill any captains who refused to fight. Again, this surprising level's not that successful. And, um, even with the arrival of four French galleys to reinforce them, just two galleys out of his total force available went to attack the Ottomans. Both the galleys somehow returned us unharmed and safe and very brave. On the 25th of August, the Venetians managed to capture some, uh, some uh, Ottomans uh, galleys. It was brilliant, they'd captured some. However, they got so obsessed with looting these ships that the Ottomans actually managed to recapture them. The French reinforcements abandoned the, the Venetians and went off to Rhodes. And two Venetian carracks, captained by uh, another gentleman called Andrea Loran, 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 Got it right in the end. A member of a very influential uh, family and cousin to a future doge. And by Al Alban Adama. Boarded, managed to board one of the command ships of the Ottoman fleet. This led to Burak Reis, who was in command of the vessel, setting her aflame. Which actually meant to le led to all three ships burning together. This, of course, dealt a blow to Venetian morale. And because the Venetian fleet are the ones which withdraw in disarray, it's considered a Venetian loss. And this is the first ever battle where both sides are firing cannon at each other. Grimani is arrested on the 29th of September, well, that's a little over a month later, and banished the island of Cesso. He doesn't become Doge of Venice till 1521, which if we consider he was um, 65 in 1499, 1521 he will have been mm, roughly Roughly 86. This is perhaps another problem for the uh, for Venice in that, whilst you probably want experienced, capable people to become your Doge, there is a problem in that. Whilst uh, uh, there is a problem, especially with the quite small pool you're drawing from, of octogenarians. 
not all of them are going to be active or mentally acute enough still to actually do the job with the uh, lateral thinking you probably need in the role, especially considering your conundrum or position. In fact, they might well think, well, it worked well for me when I was in my 50s, 60s leading armies, and when I was in my 20s and 30s fighting those armies, it worked well for me now, and it didn't. And then we have the Battle of Modon. And please note, I have found a picture, well, as close as we can get of the picture of Kimores and his flagship, the Goka. Goka. And this is the Battle of Modon, which is slightly more. Slightly more. Uh, this took place in August 1500. And, well. The Ottomans had won Zoshino, as mentioned, which is otherwise known as the First Battle of Lepanto, or the Battle of Serbesia, the previous year. And in December 1499, the Venetians attacked Lepanto with a hope of regaining territories which they'd lost, because the Battle of Zoshino had seen them lose lands. Reis set sail from Cephalonia and retook Lepanto from the Venetians. He stayed there between April and May 1500. And when I say retook, he seems to have walked in and done it fairly quickly and efficiently, suggesting A, the Venetians hadn't really put a decent garrison there, B, they hadn't managed to fix anything or uh, in, to bar his way in, and C, stockpiling or supplies or logistics had been something which happened to other people. Which is always kind of interesting, because when you're in an empire which has basically built itself on being a logistics provider, discounting the logistics is penny-pinching, and you know it. He decided he wasn't going to stop there. He set sail, bombarded the Venetian coast of Coron, and captured the town along with the uh, over Venetian brigantine, um, a vessel, and then set sail to the island of Sp 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 Piazza, and sank the Venetian ga uh, galley at Leza, and then... Assaults of Vuissa and in October, appears at Cape Santamira on the island of Lafkanda for ending the campaign and returning to the Constance Open November. The bombarding of the fortress of Mordon in the middle, capturing the town and stopping the Venetian fleet from being able to use that facility was considered critical. Because by taking out Mordon and Caron, the two eyes of the Republic were lost. Ottoman cavalry raids, therefore, managed to get into northern Italy. They are basically the, uh, the positions which the, the Venetians had forward, which had been central for their intelligence gathering, their overwatch of the, of the ocean, and etc., were lost. And if we consider where they are... In terms of Mordon and Caron... Well, Kron is down here in the bottom of Greece, and Modon is modern Mephonia, which is not that, tr it's pretty much the same area. And they had been critical to watching for things, uh, for movements coming around at this point. It was a hard war. As a result of this uh, battle and what had happened in terms of their ca the various campaigns, well, Doge Agostino Baringo asked the Pope and Catholic monarchs for help. So, in December 1500, a Spanish-Venetian army commanded by Gonzalo de Coberta Always an interesting gentleman. Turns up and does what it needs to do. And what does it need to do? Well, 
it takes Cephalonia and stops the uh, Ottoman offensive on Eastern Vaginesian territories. However, between 1501 and 1503, Ottoman incursions in Dalmatia escalated to the point where the only person who becomes really rich as a course of this war is King Vladislaus of the Second of Hungary, who the Venetians support with various diplomatic attempts, including helping arrange marriages, a marriage for his daughter, which is what eventually leads to the dual monarchy of Austro-Hungary. Uh, Pope Alexander the Sixth um, also was involved, and well, basically Vladislavius gets 140 ducats a year for all the Kingdom of Hungary to, in order so it can actively defend its southern Croatian territories with the aid of Venetian Dalmatia. So basically, the Venetians offer to send troops, supplies, act as a logistics hub and give you money to hire your own troops and build your own fortifications in order for you to do this really nice thing of stopping the Ottomans coming through your territory. Which, by the way, he was already doing because, frankly, he was getting fed with the Ottomans coming through his territory. But he was also setting up a situation which was going to lead to a lot of overmighty uh, barons. A lot of overmighty barons in Hungary. By the end of 1502, Venice and all the Ottoman Empire agreed on an armistice. And then in January 1503, Venice signed another treaty with Vladislavis, uh, having already paid 124,000 ducats for the previous treaty. The Pope had very kindly provided 16,000 of the 140,000. They added a further 30,000 ducats a year. To keep the forces in readiness, basically. And then in 1503, as mentioned earlier, Turkish cavalry raids managed to reach Venetian territory in northern Italy. And the Venetian cities in Dalmatia have basically lost their economy. By 1510, Vladislaus had received a total of 116,000 ducats under the terms of the Second Treaty of Venice. The League of Cambri tried to get him to join the war against Venice, but uh, thankfully Venetian money and Venetian diplomacy managed to prevent, uh, prevent that, because basically Vladislaus went, so you want me to attack them, which is going to make them less capable of paying, and you don't want to give me any money to replace their paying. And you're not going to back me up if the Ottomans attack me. But you want me to attack them? This is not necessarily the best idea for me. Please note. Now, I will say, the best books about this are mostly in Hungarian and about this whole period, which is a rather appropriate considering the only ones who really made any money. But it does mean that our actual study of it is kind of limited. But... I suppose the legacy and the lesson of the Second Ottoman Ottoman Ottoman, Ottoman Venetian War is simple, really. You can have the best war-winning formula in the world, but if you can't adapt it and alter it to something else when your opponent adapts to finding its weakness, you are schnookered. Completely and utterly schnookered. And that was the trouble for Venice. They were very good at fighting these quick wars, about dancing around, using the sea, dropping in small forces, taking out this, that and the other with surprise and 
logistics and when they have to fight someone who is prepared to turn up for the long haul who brings huge resources to bear they have a problem interesting enough the venetian methodology of making money i.e. setting up this sea route etc have been a key underminer of the Byzantine economy, which led to the Byzantine Empire falling to the Ottomans. And one, you can sort of wonder if the Ottomans looked, understood that and felt, well, you know, we're going to make sure the Venetians don't undermine our economy, because we like having control. Admittedly, we have control of land all that way. Not that way, no. That way and lots of stuff and territory that way, but they could still get stuff around us, and that means we won't be making any taxes or profits off it, and that's bad, because that's what we want to do. We want to make money off the spice trade, off the goods which are going east-west and west-east. I know, we always hear about the goods coming from the east to the west. Which is always a lovely thing for people to talk about. Yes, they're importing all these goods. I mean, goods have to go that way to be pay, to pay for it. Goods have to go both ways. Or alternatively, you will need to find humongous gold and silver mines in Europe. And there really aren't that many. That's one reason why the Spanish go to South America. Admittedly, they think they're going to India, but, you know, it's one of the reasons why they go there, looking for money. I oh, know. First battle to involve cannon. I'm sure the rate of fire was so slow the gunnery crews could take, uh, take a nap in between firing their guns. Probably did take a nap. A very cool and capable animal. At one point, he actually gets given by the um, gets given gets given a ten of the ships that he's captured from Venice because, well, you know, you might as well. The Sultan goes. Sultan Bayezid the second basically goes. Hmm, Kemal, you've done a good job. Here, I have ten of these ships. Oh, and by the way, then I will be hiring them off you to fight war or fight the war on my behalf. Thank you, my lord. It's a good way to make me rich. Admittedly, it's also a good way to um, keep them on the payroll. And also, it, it's going to sound strange. It means that he's probably going to concentrate the people who are his more loyal people in those ships, which means you don't you can have a more of an idea of where and who's loyal to him. There are falls and against in all these scenarios. Anyway, what have we got coming up? Well, tomorrow we have the Hyder video, which I'm going to be re-recording seconds of this evening, and then the boxing. Then we have the Albany class, and then we have the Lehe class. Then it's Belknap class. And then it's 100 Years of Gun Cruisers. That's going to be fun. That's Thursday. And then US Nuclear Power Cruisers on Friday. And Tikaronga class on Saturday. And then... Whew, a whole lot of recordings to do. That's going to be fun. Take care. Have fun. And hope you're enjoying. And hope you have a good Christmas Eve. Toodles.